Management of diabetic foot ulcer. So the moment a patient comes with a diabetic foot ulcer, clinical examination is the must and the peripheral system, sensory system examination is done. Based on that, an ulcer categorized, ulcer is categorized using either Wegener scale, Wegener's classification system or University of Texas classification system or Wi-Fi classification system. And then the ulcer is categorized as neuropathic or ischemic ulcer. If it is an ischemic ulcer, it is categorized into purely ischemic or ischemic with neuropathy. So if it is a pure neuropathic ulcer, the treatment begins by cure by patient should patient ulcer should be completely the infected the infection in the ulcer should be treated with appropriate antibiotics based on the culture sensitivity. The pressure points are eliminated by using a proper footwear after assessing the pressure points. Then the footwear should the foot patient should be on either total contact cost or offloading shoes and along with the dressings for and it should be followed up for four weeks. At the end of the four weeks, if healing has occurred very well, the patient's footwear patient should be encouraged to follow how to manage how to manage at home, how to take care of their foot, self-examination of the foot and their footwear. If the if the healing has not occurred at the end of the four weeks, then other therapies which includes topical biological therapies, vacuum assisted pressure dressings, autologous skin transplantation, hyperbaric oxygen therapy and uh, alpigraft, dermograft are all used as a choice for treatment in those patients who are having a chronic non-healing neuropathy ulcer. So in case, of, in case of patients who are having angiopathic or angioneuropathic foot ulcer, it is the, uh, the patient, the immediate treatment will be the infection control that is done based on uh, the pulse, pus, pus culture and sensitivity along with localized wound deprivement and the patient should be immediately referred to the vascular surgeon for revascularization procedures. So first step in wound management, diabetic wound management starts begins with uh, managing the wound. So it is, it is the abbreviation used is T-dime. T includes tissue and non-tissue, non-viable or deficient. It includes removal of all the dead debris, all the dead tissues has to be removed. D for debridement. The, all the dead tissues that are present in the ulcer has to be removed. I is for infection control and inflammation control. This can be uh, bad bacteria accounts for most of the common cause for prolonged inflammation. Appropriate antimicrobial should be chosen based on the culture sensitivity. Moisture, moisture imbalance. It has been noted that any ulcer that is kept open, it will reduce the surface temperature of the ulcer which can delay the wound healing. So closure of the, di closure of the diabetic foot ulcer is very important. If proper moisture is retained, the ulcer healing can, be, can improve. Then edge of the wound or non-advancing or undermined, non-migrating keratinocytes and non-responsive wound cells are, man are managed by use the help of biological agents and adjuvant therapies and deprivement which can stimulate the keratinocyte migration. Wound dressings. Wound dressings is a separate and a large topic for today's discussion but I am going to sum up shortly how practically you can use a diabetic food, diabetic food dressings. So when a patient is coming with a diabetic foot ulcer, either you are going to see the diabetic foot ulcer with a worsened neuropathic is or worst or worst ischemia or with the worst in spreading infection or there will be an ulcer that is non-infected and persistent for a long duration. So based on the type of infection and the etiology, the dressings are chosen. I will give an idea of how a dressing has to be chosen. A dressing can be either passive dressing or an active dressing. Passive dressing, the name itself tells that the dressing will cover the wound. 
it will take care of moisture to some extent it can prevent the it can absorb some amount of exudates and it can prevent hypothermia but it will never interact with any phases of wound healing whereas interactive dressing means those those dressings that will exactly act on the wound either by causing auto debridement or increasing the granulation tissue formation or epithelialization so interactive dressings when to use on how to select these dressings is what we are going to discuss now any patient who is having a badly infected foot with necrotic material debridement sharp debridement surgical debridement is the primary treatment of choice the once the debridement is done it can be the other choice for this is maggots therapy bot fly bot fly is the bot fly larva are used for by which are been properly kept in the lab can be placed on the wounds for doing debridement the other debridement material is this mechanical debridement using debris soft or vasa jet can be used then for uh, autolytic debridement you can use hydrocolloid and hydrogels so the initial initial treatment in a necrotic infected ulcer is my main role is for debridement once the dead necrotic tissue is removed then it can the dressing can be changed then the then it is categorized into deep wounds or shallow wounds if it is a deep wound a high and having high exudate hydrogel hydrogel or alginates can be a choice and whereas low exudative wounds still you can use hydrogel and hydrocolloids what are the advantage of using hydrogel and hydrocolloids hydrogels are nothing but polymers they have a tendency to absorb large amount of water so once they absorb large amount of water they will become a gel like the advantage of that is when they come in contact with body fluids they will absorb all the exudates and they will use all the leukocytes against the wound and it will cause auto debridement activity the advantage of using hydrogel is it retains moisture retaining moisture is one of the important part in wound dressing because it it promotes wound healing rapid wound healing by increasing the epithelial migration then high exudating wounds where you can use alginates alginates are nothing but as alginic acids extracted from brown seaweed and brown algae it contains and all of it is it is it is gelled up with sodium or calcium salts the advantage of using alginates is it can absorb 20 times its size so large exudating wounds can take care of uh, can be taken care by use of alginates and similarly one advantage of using alginates is it can also control the minor bleeding ooze that is occurring during dressing then in, in case of shallow wounds if it is also low exudate or high exudate again you can for low exudate you can use hydrogels or uh, or hydrocolloid for high exudate you can use either foam or hydrofiber for granulating wounds well granulating wounds superficial or deep the best you can use is hydrogel or hydrocolloids once they are become superficial uh, uh, adherent film is more than sufficient enough for a non healing wound for a long duration a biopsy is taken to know what is the underlying etiology and and a swab is taken to know what type of organism is there and then based on that the treatment is tailored management of diabetic foot when they present when the patient comes with the diabetic foot after assessment of the ulcer peripheral pulses peripheral pulses and sensation and the infection part has to be identified whether the patient has come with an abscess gangrene or if the infection is confined to the toe or confined to the foot why it is very important because based on that only treatment is been designed if you see the anatomy of the foot there are four compartments one is medial compartment other is lateral compartment then is superficial central compartment and calcaneal compartment these compartments can be approached by separate incisions to may to approach the medial compartment and central compartment and a longitudinal incision is made from the base of the second metatarsal till the midfoot it can easily access the superficial compartment the medial compartment and central compartment similarly lateral incisions made on medial and lateral aspect of the foot can can easily approach the lateral and medial compartment and incision made on the first web space in the dorsal aspect of the foot can reach the deep compartment also why it is very important because if the incision was not laid appropriately the access to these compartments will not be easy where uh, that is most important in case 
when you are managing diabetic foot infections then as a overall how diabetic management and sepsis management is done in diabetic foot ulcer patients a patient who is having diabetic foot ulcer can come with a localized infection without systemic signs those patients will require only wound care diabetic diet advice insulin antibiotics and foot care whereas those patients who are having diabetic foot ulcer with systemic signs like sepsis those patients should require in hospital admission if there is a complication like diabetic ketoacidosis might should be managed with appropriate iv fluid for resuscitation and and it should be given iv infusion insulin infusion should be given antibiotics and along with that the wound wound should be managed appropriately foot pad pressure assessment is very important once the patient is been recovered because any patient who is having diabetic neuropathy or charcot changes foot pad pressure foot pressure is be abnormally altered so a foot pad has to be appropriately designed to in order to prevent the pressure points occurring in the same area this picture shows chronic non healing neuropathic ulcer uh, which has been managed with the total contact cost the the most important part by before applying the total contact cost is this patient should not have a peripheral arterial disease total contact cost is a total contact cost is one of the very good choice for patients who are having non infected neuropathic ulcers the advantage of this total contact cost is it can allow the patient more patient to be mobile and patient can be managed at outpatient basis the cost should be changed once in 3 to 5 days and the prerequisite for applying the cost is patient should not have an underlying peripheral arterial disease and they should not be having any active spreading infection offloading shoes offloading shoes is also a treatment option for chronic non healing non infected neuropathic ulcers so based on the pressure points the insole and outsole of the foot is designed and they are they are supported with the help of velcro straps the most important part in assessing the offloading shoes is the moment the foot is the footwear is designed the patient should be taught how to walk with that footwear and the footwear should be regularly inspected by the patient to look for any friction blisters or ill fitting ill fitting footwear if it is so it should be immediately changed and patient should be patient should be properly examining their footwear for any damage or any prick of nail or thorn is there if it is so they should immediately do a self examination to identify whether there is an underlying spreading infection caused by the trauma then management of the surgical management of diabetic foot ulcers after the foot ulcer primary treatment has been occurred a primary treatment for the diabetic foot ulcer has been done with the help of the debridement wound dressings so there will be a, there is going to be an ulcer that requires a second recovery because any ulcer that is going to be for a longer duration it is going to increase the morbidity of the patient and so the, the based on the location of the ulcer the management options is available sural artery flap is used for heel cover the problem with the, these type of flaps the flap covers are done for the sole of foot the most important part in doing the flap cover is there are different types of flap one is called pedicle flap and it is called free flaps today i have chosen only to tell about pedicle pedicle flaps sural artery pedicle flap is mobilized from the posterior aspect of the calf and to cover the heel pad and the posterior aspect of the heel the problem with this flap is the skin of the chin of the calf is not equal to that of the skin in the sole so the problem is the pressure points can cause can cause maceration of the skin over the over the flap that is been placed so a patient should be having a specialized shoe and they should be properly thought that the skin what is been skin pedal what is been placed in the heel is not equal similar to that of the sole skin what is previously been there for the patient in the heel then next is medial artery medial medial plantar artery flap it is a versatile flap that versatile flap for the patient it is ideal it is something similar to that of the sole skin so it can be used to cover either the forefoot or the heel the advantage of the advantage of this uh, so medial plantar artery flap is the the skin what is exactly resembling that of the sole skin so it is more robust the most important part in placing flap covers in diabetic foot is they should not have an underlying peripheral arterial disease 
A patient who is having an underlying peripheral arterial disease are not ideal for flap cover surgeries. Then who is under who is which patients will need amputation? Those patients who are having a non salvageable foot or if the patient is having a life threatening lower limb infection which cannot be managed conservatively then those foot those foot will land up in amputations so that can be at the level of toe itself or it can be level of foot or it can be at the level of leg or even the whole limb it depends on the presentation clinical presentation of the patient so today i am not going to go into the depth of all each and every amputation so we will we will know the names on the, of the different amputation techniques toe amputation toe amputation is done at the level of the proximal phalanx that means if you if you if you remove a toe with leaving 1 cm of the proximal stump of the uh, proximal phalanx it is indicating toe amputation then if the if the toe is removed at the level of the metatarso phalangeal joint it is considered to be disarticulation of the toe similarly if the toe is completely removed along with a partial removal of the metatarsal head it is called res amputation so amputations in the foot we have discussed about toe amputation toe disarticulation res amputation then another amputation what is done in the foot is called transmetatarsal amputation then lisfranc's 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 amputation is called Tors torso metatarsal amputation or disarticulation is called the lisfranc's lisfranc's is nothing but disarticulation at the level of the torso metatarsal joint and chopart's 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 amputation at looks at the talo calcaneo talo navicular and the calcaneo cuboid level tramp amputation is called chopart's amputation this picture shows how sims amputation chopart amputation lisfranc amputation and uh, transmetatarsal uh, trans transmetatarsal amputation is different so sims amputation sims amputation the problem with sims amputation is the 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 heel pad may not be sufficient enough to give proper adequate support for the foot so pilgrov's modification of sims amputation can reduce the complications for sims amputation another problem with sims amputation is those patients who are having peripheral arterial disease will not have a good vascularized heel pad that can worsen the stump healing that can worsen the stump healing so ideally a patient who is having who is having a a four foot or a mid foot involvement or a heel pad involvement it's not ideally suited for sims amputation so if heel pad is involved in any diabetic foot preferably the choice will be preferred if there is if the foot is not salvageable a below knee amputation will be ideal so that the patient can live with a prosthetic limb so what are the important steps you should learn when a patient who is who is undergoing uh, for an amputation the patient should be informed that the patient is the foot limb limb is going to be removed and it is not going to be there forever so the patient has to use uh, other other aids to do their normal activity and they need help for certain uh, certain uh, activities and they cannot be performing the same job what they were doing before they should be need some modifications and moreover they should be relying on the prosthetic limb only phantom limb syndrome can also occur in this group of patients so patient should be properly educated that how to lead how to live with a prosthetic limb before the amputation is done this picture shows the types of prosthetic uh, limb uh, limb prosthesis available based on the level of amputation this limb prosthesis can be used there are two types of limb prosthesis one is dynamic and aerodynamic limb prosthesis dynamic limb prosthesis will perform similar to the function of like a normal limb it is it is both semi automated and automated robotic bionic limbs will take care of complete function of the foot based on gait assessment done with a machine whereas this uh, non dynamic foot are very are cheaper but only thing they are all confined only to a certain functions below knee and um, below below knee amputation stumps can be properly fitted with a non dynamic prosthesis thank you after this brief lecture you will have an idea about how to manage diabetic foot 
in patients coming with diabetic foot ulcer the goal is to make you understand the pathophysiology behind diabetic foot ulcer and how the diabetic foot ulcer management is being approached in methodically so that is the take home message what i wanted to tell have a good day thank you